concept of consideration. This concept is the principal way in which English courts decide whether an agreement that has resulted from an exchange of offer and acceptance should be legally enforceable. It is possible to see consideration as an important indication that the parties intended their agreement to be legally binding as a contract. In exchanges where there is an immediate, simultaneous transfer of, say, goods for money, the doctrine of consideration applies in theory but rarely causes any practical problems. However, it's when somebody says, I will deliver these goods next Thursday, or I will pay you a thousand pounds on the 1st of January, that it becomes important to decide whether that promise is supported by consideration, whether it's taken to mean that something has been given or promised in exchange. A quick way to remember what consideration is about is to think whether in any given transaction there's been a promise to exchange something valuable to the other party. Let us try to define consideration in slightly more concrete terms. In Cary vs. Misa in 1875, it was stated that a valuable consideration in the sense of the law may consist either in some right, interest, profit or benefit accruing to the one party, or some forbearance, detriment, loss of responsibility given, suffered or undertaken by the other. English law treats the making of a promise, as distinct from its performance, as capable of being consideration. This consideration must move from the promisee, but not necessarily go to the promisor. One could promise to pay a sum of money to a third party, for example. Also, consideration must be sufficient, but it does not need to be adequate. The requirement that consideration is sufficient means that what is being put forward must be something which the courts will recognize as legally capable of constituting consideration. The fact that it does not need to be adequate indicates that the courts are not generally interested in whether there is a match in value between what is being offered by either party. This was established in Chapel v. Nestle. It was said that a contracting party can stipulate for what consideration he chooses. The courts will not interfere just because it appears that the person has made a bad bargain. An area of particular difficulty relates to promises to perform existing obligations. There are three aspects to this topic, dealing with three different types of existing obligation which may be argued to constitute consideration. First, we consider obligations that arise under the law, independent of any contract. An example would be where a public official agrees to carry out some of their duties in return for a promise of payment for a mem- from a member of the public. In that situation, the promise of payment will not generally be enforceable. See Glassbook Brothers v. Glamorgan County Council from 1925. Secondly, we have obligations which are owed under a contract with a third party. For those obligations which are owed under a contract with somebody else, the position is much more straightforward. The courts have consistently taken the view that this can provide good consideration for a fresh promise. The Privy Council confirmed in Pau On from 1980 that the promise to perform an existing obligation owed to a third party can constitute good consideration. Thirdly, we have obligations which exist under a contract with a person who has made a new promise for which the existing obligation is alleged to provide good consideration. These are more problematic. There are two particular cases in this area which are important and you should read them carefully. Stilk and Myrick from 1809 and Williams and Roffey from 1991. Stilk and Myrick was long accepted as establishing the principle that the performance of an existing contractual obligation could never be good consideration for a fresh promise from the person to whom the obligation is owed. The Court of Appeals decision in Williams and Roffey raised the question of whether Stilk and Myrick could still be considered to be good law. Here we have a change with the introduction of the notion of practical benefit as good consideration. Williams and Roffey has not, however, affected the related rule that part payment of debt can never di- discharge the debtor from the obligation to pay the balance. This rule does not derive from Stilk and Myrick, but from the House of Lords decision in Fox and Beer in 1884. The Court of Appeal in Reselect Movie 95 confirmed the decision and we've also got South Caribbean trading where it tried to marry the decision in Williams and Roffey with the situation for part payment of debts. 
In MWB Business Exchange versus Rock Advertising in 2016, the Court of Appeal accepted something bringing the idea of practical benefit closer to eroding the doctrine on non-acceptance of part payment of debts from Fox and Beer. This area of the law is still subject to a lot of development. A further rule about the sufficiency of consideration states that generally consideration must be given after the promise for which it is given to make it enforceable. This is usually referred to as the requirement that consideration cannot be passed. A promise which is given only when the alleged consideration has been completed is unenforceable. As with many rules relating to consideration, however, there is an exception to this rule about past consideration. The circumstances in which a promise made after the act will constitute consideration has been thoroughly discussed in Pao On versus Lao Yu Long in 1980.